Well, hey, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you to Redemption Church. My name is Adam, and I'm so thankful uh, that we have an opportunity to be together today to fix our eyes on Jesus, to open up his scriptures, to learn about him, to open up our, our mouths to sing, our hearts, our love, to eyes to see this morning. So we're thankful to have an opportunity to, to do that with you. Hey, I have a couple quick announcements, and then maybe a shout out. Maybe we'll call it that. We are, as you know, a couple weeks away from Easter. And historically, Easter is one of those seasons where most people are more receptive to the idea of attending church with someone. Uh, people have done all kinds of studies on this, and, and there's this idea that 80% of people who do not have a relationship with Jesus or do not currently have a relationship with the church, 80% said they would go to church at Easter time if somebody invited them to go. And what they would also say is they've never been invited to go. And so there's this opportunity that we have to reach out to our friends, our neighbors, and our coworkers, invite them to come to church with us over the next few weeks. And most people will likely say yes to that invitation. There's a spiritual hunger and awareness and openness that I think happens this time of year around Easter. And so hopefully you'll check out your bulletin. There's all kinds of uh, neat activities and, and worship gatherings coming up that we'd love for you to be a part of. Uh, we have Palm Sunday next week where the kids are going to help lead us in worship with some great cuteness. Uh, we have Good Friday coming up. You actually have two opportunities on Good Friday. Uh, we have a community Good Friday service that we participate in. Uh, that's over at First Presbyterian Church. I believe it starts at noon. It goes for a few hours. Uh, we have pastors from local churches who all present or talk about the last seven words of Jesus. I'm word number five this year. And so if you're wondering what time I'm speaking, I have no idea, right? Somewhere between noon in 3 p.m. is when I'm speaking, but it's a great opportunity to gather with other believers to, to see what God is up to, to hear from other pastors, and to worship Jesus together. And then on Good Friday, we'll have an opportunity here at 7 p.m. where uh, we'll have a Good Friday service where every year we answer the question, why is Good Friday good? And then we'll gather here on Easter Sunday at 1030. Uh, for some of you who consider Redemption Church home, I'm just going to get ahead of this. Uh, we'd ask you to consider maybe parking a little further down the street or a leaving room in the parking lot for new people. We'll need some of you who consider Redemption Church home to possibly sit up in the balcony to make room. Uh, David was here this week. We took a pew out. He used parts from that pew to reinforce pews. They're all screwed to the ground now, so no one will flip over while you're up there. It's even clean up there, guys, I'm telling you. So we'll need some of you to maybe sit up there next week. And so we're, we're excited about that. Also, huge praise Today, Redemption Church is turning nine years old. So we can celebrate that. Yeah, praise God. It has been an incredible journey. Uh, God called our family uh, a little over 10 years ago, and we left a church that we loved. Uh, we sold our house. We cashed out our retirement. I sold my convertible Mustang to move here and plant Redemption Church. And really, all it was was a vision that God had given us. But we left kind of like missionaries, not knowing what would happen, who would partner with us, or what this journey would like, be like. Now, normally on the anniversary of Redemption Church, I, I talk about our family a little bit. And it's, uh, it's, it's easy for me to talk about because planting redemption is such a part of our lives. I mean, we, on, on Shane's seventh birthday weekend, we planted a church, right? We celebrated his birthday on a Friday, and we planted a church on a Sunday. So uh, we get to, in our family, celebrate Shane's birthday and then the birth of redemption every year. We did it this year. And over the last 10 years, our family has sacrificed and labored to continue to make this church a reality. But I don't want to talk so much about our family today. I want to talk about another family. Maybe it's a way to honor them and, and give them a shout out. See, we left the church we loved and liquidated assets and moved out here. And we literally didn't have a place to live. And so we moved in to Ron and Paula's house, who are Audrey's parents, my in-laws. Now, I have no idea what your relationship is like with your in-laws, but mine is good. So don't bring your baggage into my story, okay? 
We moved in with them. We lived there. And, and what I would say is this, is our story, the Redemption Church story, I call it, is the Rocky Balboa story of church plants. Uh, we just learned how to take a beating and get back up again. Uh, we're part of a network of churches and Converge literally created an award called the Pastor Grit Award to celebrate and honor our church planting journey and now part, celebrates other journeys like ours. And I have the privilege of coaching church planters who are going through similar stories. I will often tell people that Planting Redemption Church is one of the most joy-filled and one of the hardest things we've ever done. And so today we get to celebrate God's faithfulness to us as a church family. And we get to celebrate God's faithfulness to us as a family, but we also celebrate those who have partnered with us along the way. That even for some people that's been years, for other people that's been seasons, for some people that's been from afar. But today what I'd like to do is honor Ron and Paula Shidlow. Would you, would you give them a round of applause? Yeah. 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 So, even though Redemption Church turns nine today, Ron and Paula have been serving Redemption Church for 10 years. They got in really early, okay? Uh, Ron has served on setup and teardown. He used to pull the church trailer with his excursion. He served on sound in the worship team. He's hosted men's breakfast. And maybe one of the greatest things Ron has done in the culture or the DNA of Redemption Church is that he has had a passion to make sure that each person feels welcome and greeted at Redemption Church. While he's not an official member of the welcome team, till this day, many people will say Ron is one of the first people they met or got a handshake from when they came to redemption. In the early days, we called him the mayor of Redemption Church. Paula has served in all kinds of areas. She's overseen special events, the snack table, she's hosted hangouts, meals, care ministry, and she's served in all kinds of roles behind the scene that I don't even have time to list. Uh, Paula has been a critical part of our kids' ministry over the last nine years. I'm not overstating this. If it weren't for Paula, we probably would not have a kid's ministry. And over the last nine years, she's been trying to grow that team so that we can ensure that we have a ministry to love and to serve and to disciple the next generation of children, to teach them and to encourage them and to walk alongside parents as they raise their children in the ways of the Lord. And even while Paula no longer has kids or grandkids in kids' ministry, she continues to invest and serve in the kids' ministry. In fact, most Sundays, if you don't see her here, it's because she's serving with the kids. Like, even now, she is not in the room to hear this because she's in the basement serving our kids. And so we are so excited that on this nine-year anniversary that we could honor them, that we could honor their faithfulness and their heart to sacrifice and to serve. I had a mentor once tell me this, you do not get the church you want. You get the church you want and work for. And so we're just so thankful that we have people who are willing to sacrifice and invest to see this church continue to be faithful to Jesus and have the capability to serve everyone, no matter their age, to how old they are, to how young they are. We want to celebrate God's goodness and God's faithfulness. We want to celebrate the people who have co-labored to make Redemption Church the church it is today. It's his church, and we thank God for him, and we praise God for the lives that have been changed, for the disciples that have been made, for the seasons of difficult and for the seasons of joy. We look back to look forward because we really do believe the best is yet to come. At Redemption Church, I, I will be as honest as I know how to be. For the most part, you make being your pastor a joy. It is an honor to preach the gospel to you to faithfully serve you by preaching the Bible and caring for you. And I am so thankful for the church that we are and the church that we are becoming. I love the way that this church loves Jesus and people. I love this church's commitment to the word of God. I love our increasing passion of worship and prayer. 
I love the ways that we've seen the Holy Spirit pour out on this place, that we've seen lives change, we've seen people set free, we've seen people healed, we've seen people set free from addiction and, and oppression in their lives, that we've seen people continue to grow on their walk with Jesus, and I, I continue to believe it, that we're so thankful for all that God has done, and we really do believe the best is yet to come. So Redemption Church, happy birthday. Yeah. And what would a birthday party be without cake in the basement? So after the worship gathering, we'll give it a few minutes. We'll allow the kids to go out. If parents, you have kids, make sure you go down and check your kids out so then we can all go down to the basement and have cake. Uh, this weekend is Shane's birthday. It's also Tiana's birthday. So you can go wish them happy birthday and pretend the cake's for them, but it's really for the church and we'll just have a great time. Let me, let me pray for us. Hey, Father, we just thank you that you are good. God, we thank you that you are the God of the mountaintop good experiences, and you're the God of the valley of the shadow of death experiences, and that you're faithful. No matter what's happening in our lives, God, you are so faithful. And today, as we open up your word, God, I praise you, and I thank you that you are a good God who pursues his children, even when they're rebellious and faithless. And so, God, we put our trust in you. And God, I ask that you would continue to pour out your spirit and your blessing on the lives of the people who are Redemption Church, God, that we would continue to serve you and honor you, and that we would continue to see lives change, that we would continue to see destinies change, that we would continue to see people grow into the image and the likeness of Jesus. So Father, I pray as we open up your word today, I pray that there would be an outpouring of the spirit in this place, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see you, ears to hear you, hearts to love you, and minds to understand you this morning. I pray that you would do what only you can do in this place. So Jesus, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And all God's people said, amen. Well, hey, we have started on this new series called The Road to Redemption. And what we've been doing starting last week and what we'll do all the way up to Easter is we're kind of taking a pick, a look at the big picture of God's plan to save and to redeem and to move towards the cross and the resurrection and ultimately even heaven. And my personal goal for, for this series has been that as we take a look at some of these scriptures and some of these big idea topics that would actually build our faith that would actually build our understanding and our knowledge of who Jesus is, what God is like, and what it means to follow him. But I've also been hoping that it would, it would do something in our hearts, right? That it would increase our worship, maybe our zeal or our passion. That maybe if we take a look at some of these things, we would begin to treasure up that we begin to see the beauty and the majesty of Christ Jesus, that hopefully it would stir up our affections towards God in a way that would change us and even be visible to the people around us. Now, last week, we started with this big idea of the creation and fall. But we started with this idea of why is the gospel called good news? And we said this, for good news to be good news, it has to invade bad places or spaces. And the reason the gospel is good news is because there's bad news. And we could say the bad news like this, is God who is perfect, holy, and all-powerful creates the world and everything in it. I mean, right away in Genesis, we see the triune God, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? God the Father is the author of creation. He is the de designer of creation. He says, let there be, and there is, and it is good. That Jesus the Son is the active force of creation. Colossians chapter 1, 16 and 17 says that everything that was created were created through Jesus and for Jesus, and he holds all things together, that he is the force of creation. And then we see that the Holy Spirit is there. He is the personal presence of God that brings life, that he hovers on the water, and when God speaks, what the scripture says is God breathes. It's through the Holy Spirit that life comes. And when God creates, he names it the garden. In Hebrew, the garden of Eden means the garden of delight. And that the garden is marked by what we would call shalom. It means to be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. 
That it, when God originally creates, in his original design, there is no sickness, no shame, no suffering, no death. There's also no government, no taxes. There's nothing to fear. That in the garden is the purest form of intimacy, connectedness, partnership, and purpose. And the way that the Bible talks about this is that Adam and Eve are naked and unashamed. That they they stand before God unashamed. They stand before one another unashamed. And how do Adam and Eve respond to God who is good, creating all things, and then giving them dominion over it? Well, they rebel against him. That God gives them one command, which I don't think is overbearing, right? Like, here's paradise. Here's delight. I'm giving you authority. I want you to work the land, and you can build. I want you to be fruitful and multiply. But here's this one tree, right? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Just don't touch that. As long as you don't touch that, you'll be good. And I think the, the garden has one tree there they can't eat because it reminds us that joyful obedience always gives us life. And disobedience always brings death. And so Adam and Eve eat from the tree and experience shame and separation from God. And because of their sin, because of their rebellion, creation is reordered and it's fractured. Peace is replaced with chaos. Paradise is now marked by unrest. Relationship is now changed to rebellion. Rest has turned to violence. What was once whole is now fractured, it's incomplete, it's inadequate. For the first time, Adam and Eve feel insecure. All pain is magnified. Sickness and death are now real realities. In fact, things like work become less enjoyable and even exhausting. And what God tells them is because they came from dust, one day they will return to dust. Meaning for the very first time, death now has power over Adam and Eve. And what we call this in in theology, what we call this in the scope of the scripture is the creation and the fall of man. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about this big idea, but maybe to help us get this big idea, let me ask you this. How do you respond to people who hurt you, betray you, disregard you, offend you, or sin against you? I mean, how do you personally respond to that? Because we have to ask that question. How will God respond? Like, as we read the scripture, here becomes the question, what does God do with his creation who has now rebelled against him? And I want to answer that question today, but we're going to look at this huge theme throughout the Bible. And it's big, but it's also critical. See, there's been this dangerous thing that I think is happening in our modern time, even within the church, that people want to unhitch the Old Testament from the New Testament. Be like, hey, let's just, let's just focus on Jesus. And like, listen, Jesus is awesome. But if we unhook Jesus from the Old Testament, we actually miss out on the meaning and the beauty and the glory. It does not help us. It hinders us. And see, so what we're going to talk about today, if we miss this, We miss so much of the meaning, so much of the depth, so much of the history, and so much of the beauty of Scripture. See, what we discover is that God responds to those who have rebelled against him by coming to them and offering them relationship through what we would call covenants. And the reason we call them covenants is because God calls them covenants. Covenants. And here's what covenants mean. It might be one of the most important words that we don't talk about or understand. A covenant is simply this, entering into a formal relational partnership for a purpose. A covenant is entering into a formal relational partnership for a purpose. Now, we don't talk about this too much, but maybe, maybe we only talk about this in the church world. Right, like at Redemption, we don't have owners because we think, or we don't have members in our church. We have what we call owners of the mission and the vision. And if you want to go down that road and see what it looks like to really be a part of this church and own that, you know what we ask you to sign? is a covenant. 
that we actually enter into a covenant relationship, that we enter into a formal relational partnership for a person. But the other way that you would see this is in marriage. Right? Like in a Christian wedding ceremony, we would use these words covenants, right? The big idea is that a man and a woman, a, a bride and a groom, stand before God and their friends and their family, and they make a covenant to one another. We are entering into a, former, a formal relational partnership for a purpose, like for sickness and health, for better or for poor. Like we are together, we're going to do life in such a way that we would not do with anyone else, that we're going to commit to one another and we're going to work together to create life together, to even have children together and raise those children. We're entering into a formal relational partnership for a purpose. And yet all throughout scripture, we see covenants. These happen person to person, that people make covenants with God and that God would make covenants with us. In fact, one of the things I want you to see today is that God is a covenant maker. Now, the way we would maybe say this is like this, is God makes promises and is faithful to keep his promises. But really, the word would be covenant and one of the very first covenants that God makes with his people is that what was fractured in the garden will be restored. And that God is in the process of one day fully restoring what he originally created. We, we saw this last week for the very first time, Genesis chapter 3, 15. At the very end, he says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He's talking about there's one who is coming to the Messiah. And he's speaking to the devil. And he said, there's one who is coming who will defeat you and who will defeat what you've brought into this world, that he will defeat sickness, he will defeat sin, he will defeat shame, and he will defeat death. That all the way, like in Genesis chapter 3, we see this beautiful thing laid out, this covenant, this gospel thing, that one day what was broken will be restored. God is promising that it will happen. And see, all throughout the Bible, we see that God makes covenants with his people. And this is how God will invite people into partnership with him. It's how the story of redemption unfolds, ultimately leading to what was once broken, now being fully restored. Now, in the Old Testament, there are five what we would call foundational covenants. And in the New Testament, there is one life-changing covenant. I processed this all week and decided that if I were to try to walk you through all five Old Testament covenants, we would be here all day. And you might even be bored, maybe. So instead of me walking us through all five covenants, our friends at the Bible Project are going to walk us through those five covenants in five minutes through a little cartoon that I think is super helpful. Here if you've go. been around Christians, you've probably heard of the idea of having a personal relationship with God, which could mean different things in the Bible, like having God as a friend, or your father, or maybe your teacher. But there's one particular way that the Bible talks about this relationship that you find all over. But strangely, we don't talk about it that much. And that's the idea of a partnership with God. A partnership like working alongside someone to accomplish a goal together. Right. And this is actually what you see at the beginning of the Bible. God creates this good world full of all of this potential. And then God appoints these unique creatures, humans, as his partners in bringing more and more goodness out of all that potential. But the humans don't want to partner with God. They rebel and try to create a world on their own terms. And so this broken partnership is the Bible's explanation for why we're stuck in a world of corruption and injustice and the tragedy of death. It's not like there's just one or two humans who have bailed on this relationship. In the story of the Bible, everyone has abandoned the partnership with God. So what God does is select a smaller group of people out of the many, and he makes a new partnership with them called a covenant. And in a covenant, God makes promises and then in exchange asks his partner to fulfill certain commitments. 
And the purpose of all of this is to somehow use this covenant relationship to renew his partnership with everybody else. Now, there are actually four times in the Old Testament that we're told God initiates a covenant relationship with Noah, Abraham, the nation of Israel, and King David. And it's through these that God is forming a covenant family into which all people will eventually be invited. So let's see how these work. The first one is with Noah. So in this story, God has just brought the flood to cleanse the world of humanity's corruption. And Noah and his family are the only ones left. And so God makes a covenant with Noah saying, listen, I know that humans will continue to be evil, but despite that, I'm not going to destroy it like this again. Instead, the earth will be this reliable place for us to work together. Great. So what does Noah have to do? Nothing. And that's what's so interesting about this first covenant is that God is promising to be faithful, even though he knows humans won't be. The next time we see God make a covenant is with a man named Abraham. God chooses him, promises to bless him, give him a large family, lots of land where they can flourish. And in return, God asks Abraham to trust him and train up his family to do what is right and just. And the whole reason for this covenant is God says that somehow he's going to bring his blessing to all families of the world through this one family. So that's Abraham. The next time we see God make a covenant is when Abraham's family grows into the tribe of Israel. And this covenant is with the whole tribe. God asks them to obey a set of laws, which are these guidelines for living well as a community of God's partners. And if they do this, then God promises to bless them and that they will become a people who then represent him to the rest of humanity. That's the covenant with Israel. The last covenant is with King David. Yeah, the tribe of Israel has become this large nation ruled by David. And God asked David and his descendants to partner with him by leading Israel in obeying the laws and doing what is right and just. And God promises that one day, one of David's sons will come and extend God's kingdom of peace and blessing over all the nations. So those are the four covenants that God makes in order to restore his partnership with the whole world. But here's what happens. Israel breaks the covenant. They worship other gods, they allow horrible injustice, and so they lose their land and are forced off into exile. So it seems hopeless. But during this time, Israel's prophets talked about a day when God would restore these covenants in spite of Israel's failure, somehow. Yeah, they called it the new covenant. And this is actually what's so interesting about Jesus is that he's introduced into this story as the one who fulfills all of these covenant relationships. We're told that he's from the family of Abraham, and so he will bring the blessings of that family to the whole world. We're told that he's the faithful Israelite who is able to truly obey the law. And we're told that he's the king from the line of David. And so he goes about extending God's kingdom of justice and peace to all. And that's really remarkable for one guy. Yeah, and what it highlights is perhaps the most surprising claim of all made about this man, that Jesus is no mere human, but rather God become human. And God did this in order to be that faithful covenant partner that we are all made to be, but have failed to be. And so through Jesus, God has opened up a way for anyone to be in a renewed partnership with him. So Jesus calls people to follow him and become part of this new covenant family. And despite their failures, Jesus is committed to making them into partners who are becoming more and more faithful. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a fully renewed world, full of goodness and peace. And there's this renewed humanity there, partnering together with God to expand the goodness of his creation. And so the end of the Bible story is really a new beginning. All right. They did that way faster than I could have and probably did a better job at it. So... Here's, here's what I'm going to do. I, I told you there were five, and they said there were four. I consider the garden to be one of the covenants, so I include that in there. A little bit of a different thought on that, but that's okay. Here's what I want to do. Open up your Bibles to Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 12. What I want to do th- this morning for the remainder of our time is I want to focus on the covenant that God makes with Abraham, or as we meet him, Abram, or Abram, however you want to say it. And so what we see is that God makes this covenant with him. Okay, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 uh, to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and to your kindred and to your father's house, to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. Verse 3. 
I will bless those who bless you, and, I, and, and he who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God makes a promise to them. And, and here's, here's what you should know. Abram is 75 years old at this point. His wife is 65 years old. And he calls them to leave the land of their fathers, to leave their hometown, the place that they currently live. And, and we don't know this yet, but we'll see this later in Scripture, is, is the place that he lives will one day become Babylon. And God calls Abraham and says, I want you to leave and follow me, and I'm going to take you to the place, to the land that I have given you. Now, there's a few promises within this promise. The first promise is this, is God is going to give him and his family and his future descendants land. Right? And not just a little bit of land, enough land for a nation, which is promised to I will make a great nation from your children and from your descendants. In fact, I'm going to bless the entire world through your one family. Abram is 75. Sarai is 65. I don't know, and you probably don't know, too many people that age that are expecting children. And what they have experienced is one of the results of sin and brokenness is they have had difficulty in the area of bearing children children. They have none. And so one of the things that God is promising them is you will have a child. You will have a son. And through your family, promise number three, I will bless you and be with you, and I will curse anyone who stands against you. So Abram and his family, along with his nephew Lot, leave. They pack up everything. They take all their possessions, everyone who's a part of their family, all of their servants, and they leave to follow God to this new promised land. They have no idea where they're going or what the land even looks like. They just know that God has shown his grace and his mercy to them, and so they follow him. Now, what's interesting is in Genesis chapter 13, if you turn the page, there is conflict between Abram's shepherds and his nephew's Lot's shepherds. So they have this arrangement. And Abram, being a good guy, says, listen, no hard feelings. I don't want this to come between us. You pick where you want to go and where you want to pasture your animals, and I will then head in a different direction. And that's where I will pasture my animals. Genesis chapter 13, verse 12. It says, Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now, as Abram moves, he actually moves into part of the land that God is going to give them. Lot actually moves to a place, and this is the beginning of a great conflict between God's chosen and people who are against God. Genesis chapter 13, verse 14 says, The Lord then said to Abram, After Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give you into your offspring forever. So he has this moment where he says, Look around, look as far as your eye can see, from where you can see to the horizon, north, south, east, west. All of this land will be yours and your family's. And then verse 16, he says this, and I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring can also be counted. So God says, like, listen, you're not just going to have a family. You're not just going to have descendants. Your family, your descendants will be so big that they'll actually be uncountable. Now, what happens next, if we're kind of moving fast through Scripture, is in Genesis chapter 14, Lot, who moves to the area of Sodom, gets caught up in what is essentially a small civil war by what we might call warlords. And he and his possessions get taken, and he's kind of locked up. And so Abram sneaks in, kind of like an undercover mission, to get Lot back and to get all of his animals and all of his stuff back from these warlords. And then he has this moment where he meets with this man named Melchizedek, who was called by Scripture to be a king and a high priest. 
And Abram actually makes an offering to him and gives him 10% of all he has to honor him. Now, if you want to have fun this week, you can look up Melchizedek. But here's what the author of Hebrews says about him. It says that he resembles Jesus and that he will always be a high priest. He's this interesting figure in the Old Testament. God then meets with Abram. He's seen conflict. He's had some turmoil in his family. He's just kind of like a Navy SEAL, went undercover and delivered Lot. And then in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, God comes to him. It says, after these things, meaning the things we just talked about, the word of the Lord came to Abram in the vision. It said, fear not, Abram. I am your shield and your reward shall be great. I think this is beautiful. Like, if you're having conflict where you're rescuing family from warlords and the Lord says, shows up and says, I am your shepherd, you're like, that's pretty. But when God says, I'm your shield, you're like, sweet. Okay, we're good. And then Abram responds, look at this, verse 2, with almost frustration. Oh, Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. He's having an issue. Like, you promised that you were going to give us a child. You promised that you were going to make my family a great nation. And, like, do you see what's happening? Like, I, I just went up against some warlords and had to rescue Lot, and I could have died. And if I would have died, do you know what would have happened, God? Your promise would have never come true. In fact, everything I had would have gone to this servant that I had. And so God speaks. He reminds him of the covenant, verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, and your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside, and he said, Look toward heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring This is God's response to Abram. Like, listen, look at all the stars. Do you see them all? Do you think you can count them all? No. This This is how good my promise is to you. Your children's children, your descendants will be like the stars in the sky. And verse six says, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is faith. Abram's going, I'm I'm a little over 75 now. Like, things aren't going the way, God. Like, I followed you, but it's not working out the way I thought it was going to go. But I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe in you. Even though I don't see how this is possible, I'm going to believe that what you say is true. Verse 7, And God said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur, the Chaldeans, to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Verse 9, he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now, if you're tracking with me, you find this verse incredibly awkward. And you should. Like, could you imagine having a conversation with someone, let alone God, and going, how do I know that I can trust you? Like, how do I know that you're going to make good on your word? And this is their answer. Go find me a heifer. It has to be three years old. Go find me a female goat. She needs to be three years old. And find me a ram, also three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he'd be like, what does that have to do with anything? That's my first response. My second response is, where do I find a turtle dove? I mean, the only place I've ever heard about a turtle dove is in a Christmas song. But I don't know where to find one. Is a turtle dove different than a dove? I think I could find a pigeon, but a turtle dove, I'm not sure of. And again, what does this have to do with anything? We get to verse 15. The author of Genesis doesn't tell us what happens next, other than Abram listens. It says, and he brought him all of these and cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. 
So Abram's question is like, God, how can I trust you? And God's like, hey, go get some animals and cut the big ones in half and make an aisle out of them. And see, for us, we think this is so weird. But for him, he knew that this was a covenant-making ceremony. The back, back in this time, what people would do when they would make a serious covenant is they would take animals just like these and sacrifice them. And then the people making the covenant would then walk down the aisle signifying their covenant. This is why when someone gets married, they walk down the aisle. This is where this comes from. Now, could you imagine going to a wedding and like there's beef and rams and goats all sacrificed. They're like, here comes the bride. Very different feeling. And the reason for this, you can look this up later if you want. Jeremiah chapter 34 verse 18 What God says is this, is whenever someone walks down the aisle of covenant, he says that if someone breaks the covenant, God will make them like the calf they cut in two. This is serious. Like if, if you don't make this covenant willingly, if you're making this covenant under false pretenses, may you be like the animals that were slaughtered. So this is serious. There's some weight to this. There's a threat of death if this doesn't go right. If you thought this scripture was weird, buckle up. It gets weirder. Verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Verse 13, And the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in the land that is not theirs, and they will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. And, and, and so here's what God does. Like we, we talked about this all throughout the Daniel series, right? The kingdoms come and kingdoms go, but we can remain faithful to the one true king who rules over them all. Like God's telling Abram, like, listen, I am going to do what I've told you. You will have a son and he will have sons and you will have children who will become a great nation. But here's what I want you to know. They will be rebellious. They will be faithless but I will be faithful to them. So for this promise, for this covenant to come true, it's gonna take a while. Like it's gonna take a little bit, but God who is above time is looking forward to come back and say, listen, I want you to know that there's gonna be some suffering and it's gonna be hard, but I am making this covenant to you. It will happen, verse 14. But I will bring judgment on that nation that they serve. And afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions is for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Here's what God is saying. I will make a nation out of you, but your people will go to Egypt, and once there, they will be enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. But God says, I will bring judgment on Egypt, and I will deliver them. And when this then, when they are delivered, they will sojourn back to the promised land, that your descendants will enter this promised land. And remember, I told you, I will curse those that curse you. I will be faithful. I will destroy your enemies. Now, this is where it gets even more interesting, if this isn't interesting enough. Verse 17 When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. So what happens is, is Abram Abram sets the stage. He does what God has told him to do. And then he falls asleep. And it says almost like a dread falls upon him. This weight falls upon him. It's because God is literally there in his presence. The spirit of God is there. And all throughout the Old Testament, that when we see when, when God shows up, he often shows up in fire, right? Like Moses in the burning bush. Like leading the nation of Israel in the desert, a smoke of a pillar of smoke by day, a pillar of fire by night. This is the Father. He is there and he appears as fire, as a smoking pot of fire. He's there. And God Himself walks down the aisle. 
Now, this is so intriguing to me. Because what happens is, is God is making a covenant with Abraham. But to protect Abraham, he puts Abraham into a deep sleep. Like, notice, Abraham never walks down the aisle. But who does? God. God says, I'm making this promise to you, and I, as the Lord, will walk down the aisle. Because he knows Abram, like Adam, and like Noah, who came before him, they will follow God imperfectly, they will doubt God, and they will sin against God. God is saying this. He's making the covenant with Abraham. But he will not allow the decisions of men to get in the way of his promise. He says, hey, Abraham, you're going to sit this one out. But I myself will ensure that this happens. I myself put my holiness, my integrity, my word on the line that when God walks down the aisle, he says, this is for sure. This will happen. Now you ask the question, why in the world would we take a Sunday to talk about this? Like, why in the world would we go through this passage in Scripture that seems somehow obscure and in our culture seems weird? I mean, we're talking about butchering animals and walking down the aisle, and it's because of this. I need you to see this. I want you to get this. I want you to grab onto this. See, when Jesus arrives, he arrives as the one who will fulfill the covenants. If you have your Bible with you, go to Luke chapter 22, and we're going all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Luke chapter 22, if you're new to this, you don't know what it is, it's, if you get the New Testament, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, right? If you get to John, you went too far. Luke chapter 22, we're also going to have this up on the screen. For about three years, Jesus has been with his disciples. He's been, he's been revealing who he is. He's been calling them to deeper intimacy and in ministry. He's giving them the keys to the kingdom. He's called them to be fishers of men and disciples of men. And he's been telling them that one day he will go to the cross, that he will be betrayed, that he will die, and he will rise again on the third day. And he says this in Luke chapter 22. He says, And the hour had come. And he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom. So he's celebrating the covenant that God made with Moses and the Israelites, that he would be a deliverer, that God will shed the, the blood of the lamb so that the wrath and death passes over. They're celebrating this meal. And Jesus says, I've been eager to do this with you. And then he tells them this, I will not take this meal. I will not have this meal until we're all in heaven. Verse 17, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves so they each take a portion so they all have some. Verse 18, for I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So Jesus says, listen, this is the last time I'll do this on earth. Verse 19, and he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup. After they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus sits with his disciples and he says, remember the covenants that God has made? Like, do you remember Adam? Do you remember Noah? Do you remember Abraham? Do you remember Moses and Israel? Do you remember David? Remember the promises that God has made? Jesus says, this is that promise fulfilled. He says, this is that new covenant in my blood. The bread is the symbol that Jesus, the Son of God, will bear our sin and our shame, that he will go to the cross on our behalf. The cup is the blood that his life, his death, and his resurrection will establish and fulfill these promises. And what he's telling his disciples is this, I know what happens next. 
And while you will be confused, what I'm bringing is the kingdom of God. What I'm bringing is salvation. What I'm bringing is the fulfillment of all the promises has made. The promise to Adam, the promise to Noah, the promise to Abraham, the promise to Israel, the promise to David that Jesus is the covenant keeper. What we see is this. This is why this is so important. As we see that God is a God who pursues his people. God is a faithful God who pursues his stubborn, rebellious, and often faithless children. But then we see this, that Jesus is the better Noah, who brings judgment upon sin and salvation by grace to the family of God, and he will lead us to a new world free of sin and all of its effects. That Jesus is better than Abraham. He is the blessing to all the nations of this earth. That Jesus is better than Moses. Is God's prophet who fulfilled the law for us. Jesus allows God's wrath to pass over us because of his shed blood. Because he conquered our Pharaoh, Satan, redeemed us from sin, and journeys with us towards home despite our sin, our rebellion, and our grumbling. We see that Jesus is the better David who is seated on the throne, ruling as the king of kings and is coming again to establish his eternal and global kingdom of peace and prosperity. And again, we go, okay, but like, tell me what this means for us. It means God has been pursuing you before you were ever born. And that God has a plan and his whole plan is leading us to Jesus and one day leading us for heaven. And so this is why we were calling this series The Road to Redemption because next week we, we celebrate Palm Sunday and we, we celebrate Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, donkey and we go, why is this important? Because the covenant keeper is coming to his people. If we begin to celebrate that God is faithful and true and he's kept his word to us and he's inviting us into this where we can be free from sin, from shame, from death, that we have the hope of eternity in Christ and Christ alone. And it has always been God's plan to save and to redeem this way. And he has. He is faithful. So even when we opened this morning, we, we sang the song about God being the God who keeps his covenant. Our God is a promise Keeper, even now as we begin to take communion together, we celebrate that we have a new covenant, that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And that sin and shame and Satan have been defeated on our behalf, and we are sure that we will have heaven and life to life to the full because Jesus is the one who keeps the covenants. Will you pray with me? Hey, Father, we come before you in the great name of Jesus. We thank you that we have an opportunity to worship you today and to praise you today, and to grow in our understanding of this big idea of covenant today. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would lead us in that. God, I pray that you would reveal to us what you want us to hear in that, and that we would worship you and treasure you and know that you are a God who pursues his people. And even now, God, as we move to taking communion, may we celebrate the covenant that you established for us that you have dealt with our sin and you have dealt with our shame. When we repent of our sin and when we believe in you, we are given new life, a new identity, a new hope. We're filled with the Holy Spirit that you tell us that we have life and life to the full and we have the promise of eternity with you always, forever and ever. So we thank you, God, and we praise you that you are a promise keeper, that we can trust you that we can put our faith in you. And we praise you and thank you that you have been pursuing us, that you're pursuing us even now. And maybe for some of us in the room, today's the day that we need to respond to you because you are a God who pursues. So Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. And we pray all of this in your name, the name above all names. Amen.